Doc here for DetroitBeardCollective.com, Detroit's premier grooming company. Visit DetroitBeardCollective.com if your beard is feeling dry, scaly, if you need to maintain your beard. This day and age, there's products out there that helps you take care of your beard. Beard butters will make your beard feel softer, better smelling than ever before. The Doc actually rocked a beard earlier this spring and summer, and I actually used the beard butter. I heard that Adam was into styling, and I'm like, you know what? Let me take care of myself. So I went to DetroitBeardCollective.com and bought the beard butter. My face actually does feel smoother. I definitely checked out the products at the Detroit Beard Collective. They got great t-shirts, oils, the ultra-popular Beard Crate, which is a wide assortment of a bunch of different Detroit Beard Collective products. So definitely support those who support us, DetroitBeardCollective.com. Wow, he has trouble with the snap, and the ball is free! It's picked up by Michigan State's Jalen Watts Jackson, and he scores on the last play of the game! Unbelievable! It doesn't matter, dude. Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> moments in the world of sports when you can say you were totally shocked, amazed at what you saw. Saturday was one of the most epic moments for us Sparties, not only because we defeated Michigan. It was a great game, a beautiful fall Saturday, but the manner in which Michigan State won that game was befitting all the nonsense that us Sparty fans had to deal with. Welcome, everybody, to a premiere episode of the Doc and Jock Sports Podcast. Post-Michigan, Michigan State, we will not let this die. I will not let this what die. What did you guys have to go through? What did you have to endure? Please explain before I sit there and take you to task for your, for your brash cockiness after you acted like a little bitch. Let me tell you why. What Punk- did you have to endure? Tell me this cross that you had to bury and carry up a hill. Tell me about it, please. From the moment Jim Harbaugh signed the contract, the media, the Michigan fans have all been at their knees, kissing his ass, telling us everything. They're happy they got a coach. We had Brady Hoke for three years. Before that, we had Rich Rod. All the coverage was slanted in one direction. Oh, my God. Now, even after the victory, and we'll talk all about this, there is now a narrative going around that Michigan State could be undefeated and be out of... Uh, the playoff to a one-loss team. The lack of respect that Michigan State has gotten for the better part of the last eight years has been pent up. And I know you've been saying, puff out your chest, puff out your chest. But I'm more yes, rational. Yes, do it. Do it before. No, Don't no. do it after. No, you do it after the result. No, do it before. If you're so confident in your damn team, this is what I'm going to talk to you about. This is what I'm going to talk to all you garbage-ass Michigan State fans out there about. If you're so damn confident about your school, about your program, you guys have a hell of a coach. You have a hell of a coach. Be confident in it. Don't sit there and do it after the fact and then troll people. You've been trolling me for four days. I'm going to take you to task on that word. I think as a very bright and very talented young man, I think you need to expand your vocabulary and stop using words like trolls. You are a troll. I'm not a troll. You are a troll. I am not searching for a reaction. I am happy that my team, the team that I, you know, the school that I graduated from, won the game in, it wasn't like it was a last, it wasn't like we dominated the game. It wasn't like we had a lead at any point in the game. No, it was we a won, We won in a miracle, miraculous fashion. So in the end, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to tell you that we, we won the game. We upset and we shocked the world. I mean, I cannot stop visualizing shocked that guy world. crying. We shocked the world. You guys were ranked seventh in the country. 0.02% chance that we win the game. 
before the punt happens. We had literally no that. chance. I'll buy that. That's the stat. Yeah. We had no chance to win the game. He kicks the ball. He throws the ball. Anything but botching that punt, Michigan State loses. And Michigan played Antonio, a great game. Antonio, I'll coach Tarball. It was a Those great game. Those final 10 seconds, Antonio, I'll coach Tarball. I'll tell you it right now. Right to your face. Right to your face. It was awesome. And really what's happening is, and and – I apologize. What I'm doing is I'm displacing my frustrations with how the Michigan program is viewed and what's been talked about since the loss onto you. So unfortunately, you're getting the brunt of all the the jokes, the tweets, the text, and we're going to play the Jamel Hill clip a little bit later on talk about it. Can't wait for that hot pile of garbage. But that was awesome. Michigan State owns Michigan, winners of the last seven of eight games against Michigan. Michigan deserved to lose in that fashion, and I'm, I'm proud... To be able to say that Michigan is now nobody deserves up to, the level to of lose state. in that fashion. Yes, they you did. as Michigan State Ooh, fans don't deserve to lose in that fashion. It was great. Ohio State fans don't deserve to lose in that fashion. I hate Ohio State fans. Notre Dame fans, who I think I might despise more than I do Ohio State fans, and your garbage program, I don't think deserve to lose that way. Take, nobody deserves to lose that way. Just tell me now. Take me through. What happened from your point of view? I'll tell you what what happened with me, mm-hmm. but I can't wait to hear. Oh yeah, what unless happened? you lost cell service, that's the only thing that's going to excuse you from this. What happened? All right, so I'm sitting there, right? I'm at my at my local watering hole, watching this game with a couple of my buddies. I'm pretty sure you're at home, stuck on your couch watching it because you got the whole Spartan sanctuary going on. You've got candles lit into your painting of D'Antonio sitting there just worshiping him. So I call you out before. And during the game, as a proud Michigan fan, because I, you know what, going into it, I thought they were going to win. I really did. And, and I caught myself on the podcast last week. I caught my tongue and I sat there and I, and I kind of reeled it back a little bit. But as that game kind of got going, those competitive juices started flowing and I started feeling it. And I was like, you know what, Michigan is going to win this game. They're going to win it. And you know what, if they don't, it's going to be a bloodbath. And I was prepared for a great game, which we got, which we got. So I call you out before and during the game. Sent you messages through Twitter so everybody could see. Sent you messages personally so nobody could see. And you know what I got? Dial tone. Give me the dial tone. There it is. That's what I got. I got dial tone. No response to anything I laid down. No sooner is Watts Jackson's hip dislocated and broken. You start to text message me on the low and blow my phone up like they're the damn Twin Towers and this is 9-11. And I'll admit, I didn't handle it well at all because I was devastated. I was in the middle of eating dinner while that game was going on, and I didn't handle it well. I stopped eating. I pushed my plate away. I basically buried my head, and I almost started to cry. I almost started to cry. I had to walk around with Michigan State fans all around me, tapping me on the back, telling me how it was going to be okay. I had a table of three... Large drunk men wearing Michigan State gear sitting there screaming obscenities at me. So I didn't handle it well. So then I sent you expletive-laden responses to your phone, basically telling you to die. Just in short, they were pretty creative, and I called you a whole bunch of names. Sorry about that. I did apologize to you on Sunday about that. Then, then, you pile on on Twitter, just stoking my rage, just waiting for me to explode. Just waiting and sitting there and sending me all kinds of mess. Desmond Howard, thumbs up. Thumbs up, Desmond. Where was that brash cockiness before? Where was all of that? Where? Where was this unadulterated pride, this sense of worth for your program? Where? You know what? I'll tell you. I'll tell you where. It was nowhere. Nowhere. Absolutely false. Fans like you make me sick. You're disgusting. You're small. Absolutely false. You're shameful. You bleed green and white. At least you claim you do. But you are got coward's yellow all over your body, dude. All over your body. Fans like you are garbage. At no point did I think Michigan had that game locked up. No point. At no point. However, I did believe my program, my team, and I was willing to stand tall on this mountaintop and challenge you and your program, the leaders in the state, right? The winners of the last seven of eight games between our rival schools. You wouldn't even look me in the eye, bro. You wouldn't even look me in the eye. You were a coward. You put your head down. You acted like a baby. You wouldn't even look me in the face when I challenged you. But then when the game's over, when everything's all said and done, you take right to the Twitter machine and you start sending me all kinds of messages. Why do you think I did that? Why do you think I did that? Because you're a jerk. Because you're a trolling jerk. And the thing is, I sat there in, 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 in my depression. I grabbed my phone and I sent you a message. And I believe it said, special teams, bro. 
because this was something we had talked about on this very show the week prior, and we said it was going to come down to special teams because we both believed that in the trenches they were equal. And we knew that that was going to be a bloodbath in the trenches. It was whosoever special teams showed up. And you know what? Michigan special teams showed up through 98% of that game. With 10 seconds left, 10 seconds left, Jim Harbaugh, the special teams coach, and the special teams players let Michigan fans down. They botched it. They botched it. Harbaugh got outcoached by D'Antonio for those 10 seconds. I'll admit it. I will gladly admit that he got outcoached. D'Antonio's got a great, D'Antonio's a great coach. You guys have a great, great coach. But you're despicable. You're awful. You're horrible people. People like you are awful. We both knew this game was going to hurt. Whoever won or lost it. And you have the audacity to go and pour salt in the wound. You have audacity to pour salt in the wound. You and Spartan fans like you make me sick, dude. Make me sick. All you got to do is refer back to podcast 114. I described a Hold narrative. Hold on, I'm not done yet. No, Sit there and I, shut up. I'm I not done. I described a narrative I'm not where done. we were winning. I put I'm it on tape. I'm not done. I called the score. I've got more. And I put it on tape. I'm not done. We won, fair and square. Awful. Michigan State Punter. and U of M were in a bloodbath. They were in a bloodbath. You know what this game was going to It's going to go down in history as one of the greatest of all times games between these two programs. The day after, you sat there and you sent me messages about how it was on ESPN Classics already and how they're going to replay it on ESPN2. And even with all that, you still act like scared sheep and you hide behind fictional chips on your shoulders that the ringleaders Mark D'Antonio and Tom Izzo create. How you guys are always little brother and how you guys are always belittled. You guys are ranked 7th in the country. How are you belittled? How? How? If you handle your business, there's no way you're not making a playoff. All you have to do is win out. Win out! And you're making the playoffs. That's it. That's exactly it. MSU won the game. Very fortunate. Very fortunate they won the game. U of M blew the game. I don't know if the two can go hand in hand, but they do. What's unfortunate is you and your kind. You and your kind disgust me. The fact that you guys sit there and you act like meek little sheep and you sit there and you talk about, oh, the narrative, the narrative, the narrative. Michigan this, Michigan that. MSU, MSU's always treated so poorly. They're the redheaded stepchildren in this state. This, that, and the other thing. Shut up! You were ranked seventh. You were ranked higher than us. And you got lucky that you escaped that with a victory. Everything had to work out perfectly, and it did for you guys. It was a great game. It was a magical game. It sucks that you guys lost another player to injury. All right? That blows. It does. Because you guys are like the walking dead right now. You're the wounded. For sure. But Mark D'Antonio outcoached Jim Harbaugh, and in those last 10 seconds, it was proven there on the field. It was a bad, bad special teams call, but the fact that you guys go around and you beat your chest afterwards, and then you sit there and you call Michigan, proud Michigan fans out for being proud of their school and what they've accomplished to this point, that's wrong. It's wrong. It disgusts me. Okay, so I think now now I got the reason why we disagree. I, I fully believe that I'm in the right to cheer after the fact. The reason why state fans don't like Michigan fans is you guys were puffing your chest out, talking about how you were going to dominate state before the game. And after the game I was over— I never said we were going to dominate you. No, no, not you. I'm talking exactly. about the majority, not okay. you. The majority of Michigan fans are not rational. That's right. And that's why I think the fact is now the game was lo- the game was lost by Michigan. And then now still you got people talking that, oh, oh, wait till next year. What are you talking about? You're going to roll in there to Spartan Stadium with uh, 75,000 people with a freshman quarterback that's never been in that game before. You think you're going to win? Give me a break. Give me a break. Michigan will refuse to say that Michigan State right now is on par. They're all hoping that Ohio State crushes us. And look, dude, I'll do you one better. You're above par. Very You're good. better than Michigan right now. You're seven and zero. Oh. Perfect. You are seven and zero. Oh. Perfect. What are we? We're five and two. You're better than on par. You have to recognize the way, the manner in which Michigan State won leads people to kind of act in that manner. I just have to say that that the way they won. If it was a tight, close game, I would have been, and we would have won at the end. I would have been like, good job, great game. But the manner in which they won in miraculous fashion, a mistake. A blunder by Jesus Harbaugh, by the punter that you guys brought in from Australia, <laughs> Aussie rules football guy tried to tried to basically. I don't dude, know all dude, you do dude, is that bro fall kicked, on the ball. That bro kicked an eighty yard punt. All right, I don't want to hear it. He pinned you guys on your one yard line early in the game. That that kid, he's got a leg. All right, and so he gave us just the, back up off him. And he gave us one of the best memories of all time. Tell me that if if the roles were reversed and Michigan State was leading the entire game and that had happened. You wouldn't have been a little bit excited. You, oh, not, no. not to my extent. I would have. I would have been ecstatic. I'd that have been. I would have been ecstatic for sure. But I wouldn't have sat there and continued to troll you <laughs> in the public 
or via text message for the next four or five days. And I apologize for that. No, like I said, you <laughs> sent it to me last night. You sent me a message. Because someone encapsulated it to the nation exactly why. And I'll actually just play it right yeah, now. Yeah, go ahead, play it. I'll play it right now. Play J this hot pile Jamel of garbage. Jamel Hill, great representative of Michigan State. She's doing her thing on ESPN. <laughs> And she came out there and basically, in less than three minutes, surmised my, the reason why I trolled you. So here, here it is. So for all of, oh, 20 seconds, I thought about coming in here and handling Michigan State's epic victory over Michigan with dignity, grace, and class. But frankly, you Michigan fans don't deserve that. See, for months, I've had to listen to you all act like you won the national championship because you got Jim Harbaugh. My own coach Preach. came to ESPN this summer, and he wasn't asked about his own program. No, it was Jim Harbaugh this, Jim Harbaugh that. You would have thought Michigan just hired a combination of Vince Lombardi, Bill Belichick, and Bear Bryant. The same and coming deal into this Urban game, Meyer, I thought Michigan State was playing the 85 Bears, okay? Then you hoodlums had the nerve to vandalize our statue hoodlums. of our beloved alum, Magic Johnson. Had the nerve to insult our that for academic a second? reputation. And on top of all that, my own co-host, Benedict Arnold, asked me 50 11 times. You scared? I let it play out. You, yeah, just, I just let that you play. worried? That's not how it sounds. Matter like 90 fact, more seconds. Go get me some water because the way I'm feeling right now, I might not let you talk until Wednesday. I'm a, I'm a, you can have, you go ahead, watch your tone. Uh -huh. but go ahead, keep cooking. Anyway, as much as I would have loved it if we curb stomped Michigan at the big house, it had to happen this way. Beautiful. Because this one, it hurts. This one's going to burn for a long time. That hurt is going to be all up in your chest right there. It's pain. We stole your soul. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Dude. Again, this guy, this guy encapsulated everything. I don't even think I would have enjoyed it with this guy. Oh Woo! Man, that feels good. Look, you can believe we were lucky. You can call it a miracle. I really don't give a damn. Only two things matter. We're undefeated, and you, Michigan, have now lost to us seven of the last eight times. Yes, sir. Now, I'm feeling generous, so I decided to let my co-host, Michael Smith, I'm going to allow him to speak in a few moments. But before I do, I want all you Michigan fans who are watching right now, gather real close to your television sets, turn up the volume real high, and let these three words resonate. We own you. Bam! That's it. That's all. That really, it's, that encapsulates everything that's in my little brain. I want to address two things with her real quick. I and mean, she's not here to defend herself, so you're going to have to. When Jim, or when, uh, when Urban Meyer was hired by Ohio State, ESPN had a love affair with that hiring. And everybody down in Ohio had a love affair with that hiring. And do you remember when Ohio State came and played Michigan State and there was all this buildup and all this talk and, and everything favored Ohio State? There's nothing, nothing a Michigan fan can do that you guys don't get the media recognition that you guys deserve. The only place where you get the media recognition that you deserve is in East Lansing. That's it. And That's when right. you're taking on Air Force, that's it. There's nothing a Michigan fan can do about that. If you have a problem with that, you need to go talk to the media. Go talk to ABC. Go talk to ESPN. Go talk to the Big Ten Network. Go talk to Sports Illustrated. Go talk to those people. Don't talk to us. It's not our fault that you guys are, are beneath, I guess, Ohio State and, I guess, Michigan. Nothing we can do about that. Absolutely nothing. And I know beneath is not the right word, but that's all that's coming to my mind right now. And then she wants to talk about hoodlums. Hoodlums, you say. Do you remember last year? Do you remember who started the spray paint war last year? Do you remember who that was? Do you remember who went and defaced Michigan's property? Yeah, that was Michigan State who did that. All right, yeah, and I agree. I think idiots do those types of things. I think total dummies go and they spray paint each other's rocks and they spray paint each other's statues and they do all that stuff. I think it's stupid. And do I think that spray painting Irvin Magic Johnson was a bad look? Yes, I do. I think it was bad. And the Michigan fans who did it, I think you're dumb. All right, I do. I think you're stupid. Because Magic Johnson, whether he be a Spartan or not, has done way more for the sport of basketball and for the state of Michigan than just about anybody else, all right? So to go and spray paint him because they have erected a statue of him where he looks like Lionel Richie's retarded brother. <laughs> it's a bad, that's a bad statue. It's a bad look, bro. That's not a good statue. It's not good. Maybe the spray paint helped a little bit. I don't know. All right, it, it, either way, the whole thing's a bad look. Don't do it. Don't do it. You want to go spray? You want to go? You want to go spray paint the the little Spartan soldier that's hanging out out there? Go ahead, do that. 
All right, because you guys go ahead and you spray paint, I don't know, would you spray paint a Wolverine or a rock or something? I don't even know. It's stupid. Either way, it's dumb. Why go to face each other's property? Pro yeah. I mean, there, there's no point to it. it it's absolutely just, you're, you're wasting your money on spray paint, wasting your money because you're wasting your time, you're wasting your gas, and chances are you get thrown in jail if you get caught doing that. So then you know what? You now got a lawsuit, and you got all kinds of legal fees. It's just a big, giant waste of money and time. Don't do it. Just don't do it. But there's nothing we can do because you guys don't get enough media recognition. It's not our fault. It's not our fault. Believe me, I love hearing stories about how good you guys are. I hope every time from here on in, every time we meet, I hope you guys are undefeated. Just like I hope we're undefeated. Exactly. You're right. So we can sit there and we can have a bloodbath like we just had on Saturday. And yes, it hurts. Like I said, it burns all up in your chest. Yeah, you're right. It does hurt all up in the chest. Absolutely it does. Because you care about your program. You care about your school. And all you want is you want that W at the end. That's all that matters. That's it. And you know what? Michigan blew it in 10 seconds. That's it. And you're right. Okay. Let's, but let's use a different word. I was not trolling you. You were trolling. I, I don't know. What, troll, what, what does troll mean? Troll means just doing stuff for the purpose of gaining a reaction? Yeah, pretty much. Is that what a troll yeah, is? Okay. Yeah, well, then I'm a troll. Then you're saying, there you go. <laughs> I'm a troll. We had to come to Jesus but, meeting. But in a rivalry, in a passionate, heated rivalry, in a game that unfolded like that, I mm. feel like my actions were warranted because of the fact that Michigan has such cachet, has such prowess. When Jim Harbaugh was hired, everything is all about Harbaugh, and the manner in which we won the game elicited my response and the response from Jamel Hill. So for the fact that uh, I have been uh, tweeting you and texting you, it's probably not going to stop because right. I love it, and I love the fact that in this manner— we now have a couple more memories added to this rivalry, and this will be talked about not only in 2015. This is going to go on par to negative rushing yards, the whole Brady Hoke era. This game, that singular moment, that blunder at the very end, and I was on a podcast recently, and uh, the host brought up a great point. And with time on the clock, Michigan State never won. We, the game started with zeros, and we won the game with zeros. In regulation, in between the 60 minutes, State never, never once led the game, and we all started to start getting disappointed when Michigan stopped Michigan State. I thought that was a valiant effort by the Michigan defense. I thought the game was lost at that point, and, and I thought that um, Michigan did enough defensively at the end to win the game. And But it's a 60-minute game, and special teams comes down to it, and in the end, Michigan State won the game in that fashion, and that's what really made it that much more exciting. But, you know, in the end, I love the fact that it's happened. It only took one season. The rivalry is back. Michigan State's number one rival is Michigan. The one team that when you grow up as a Sparty fan, a true Sparty fan, you dislike. And the feeling is mutual. You dislike Sparty fans. We dislike Michigan fans. It is on some level, hopefully respectful. You know, it's something that is the beauty of sports. Needling someone who's really passionate about it. Hey man, all you have to do is ignore it. Likely if I sent one or two and you don't, you don't say anything back, and you said it to me. You're like, you know, I know you're getting to me. And that's why we do it. That's, the sp that's why I love doing a podcast. And that's why I love the fact that we have this rivalry where you're a Michigan guy and I'm a di and you're a, a Walmart guy. And I'm a, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you say I slipped that in there. <laughs> and I'm a uh, graduate of the Michigan State mm -hmm. program. So, hey, man, it's all good. The rivalry's real. And this is what it's supposed to be. Every game that these guys play, I'm hoping Harbaugh and D'Antonio stay there for years. It's going to be, I think, now. The Michigan-Michigan State rivalry is on par for Michigan State as Michigan-Ohio State, period. Michigan cannot look ahead anymore, ever, as long as D'Antonio's there, to Ohio State. You better look to Michigan State because each team, each matchup that these guys play are going to wreck each other's seasons. And that's what it's about. When these two programs are good and solid, going into the games with no losses, one losses, they are going to wreck each other's seasons. And I'm talking about in the polls, and I'm talking about uh, recruits. Each game, as it happens, is going to cause a, a massive sway either way, and that's what it's about. And I'm so happy now Michigan State on the level of Michigan and surpass them. It's so good. It's great to be here. And, again, I'll apologize for the frequency of the messages. But the way the game played out and the, the whole ambiance of it, the pictures, the, the fans with their hands on their head, that girl with the fake hair standing there, the guy crying afterwards, the entire thing, the ambiance of that story – lent itself for a little bit of extra needling. And for that, I'm sorry. It's going to hurt, and you're going to have to wait another 364 days, baby, because it'll be in my head forever. All right, I know we're up against it, but real quick, what did you take out of the game? What, what, what's, the, what's the one or two points that you took out of it for Michigan State and for Michigan? 
Connor Cook made some beautiful throws in the fourth quarter. He really cemented himself as being a guy that you can count on maybe to lead a team late. And for Michigan, you just really look to the fact that this team has grown significantly. And in a, a relatively short period of time, less than eight games, Jim Harbaugh has instilled a program and a system that can compete with teams like Michigan State, that can compete with guys like Ohio State. And just imagine now when, when Harbaugh gets the guys that he pins for his system. Look out. It's going to be a beautiful thing to watch. Michigan's back um, as an elite-level program, and they're on the right path. And we have and, and they instill fear in me enough not to make any kind of bets. I'm smart enough. I'm not a silly guy. I'm rational. I realized that game was going to be tight, and I almost kind of almost realized it might take a miracle to win on the road in Ann Arbor in that in that atmosphere with the the way the injuries kind of shook out for Michigan State. It was going to be super tough. It almost lent itself to almost being that was the only way we we're going to win. It's something fluky, crazy at the end, and uh, that's the way it went down. I'm literally don't want to know when Michigan State plays Michigan every year because it's going to be a brutal game each and every game. I don't see I don't see a game going forward that's not going to be within 3 to 10 points every year that these two coaches are there. It's going to be fun to watch. I'm happy the rivalry's back. As much as it's fun to dominate a team, it's way more fun when Michigan comes in at number 12. Way more fun. Pretty much I took the same thing out of it. U, U of M isn't well at least for U of M anyways. U of M isn't quite there yet, but they're much further along than I think we both expected or anybody expected, you know, they're, they, they can't go up against the number seven team in the nation right now. Well, I guess they can just not for a full 60 seconds. We'll just leave it at that. And as far as MSU, I think MSU might have a special team to be seven and O and to have overcome as much as they've overcame with all the injuries. If MSU can catch fire, they're making the playoffs. One more win versus Indiana. We get that bye week and we get our more of our guys back to make this run. One more week. Just avoid the trap game versus Indiana. Indiana can light us up if we don't really show up. State's coming out as, like a, I think, a 15-point favorite, but they have to be careful in a letdown game, especially as much, as much emotion that was let out for that game. they got to be careful to not overlook Indiana. But if we do, we get the bye week, and then it sets up. Please, please, God, let some teams that are ahead of us lose some games because I don't want to be that number five team if there's all if there's five undefeated teams because I do believe state and the lack of respect that they have nationally will end up five if there's five undefeated teams. Dude, what you got to realize, though, is TCU and Baylor have to play each other, so somebody's going to get a loss there, yep. all right? Michigan State's got to play Ohio State. That's going to be a tough game. I, I, I'd have to look at the, up the updated standings, but mm-hmm. there are people who are ahead of you who have to play each other, and so somebody's going to end up with a loss there. Your main concern and all you have to do is take care of your business. Play your games, don't have any letdowns, and when you get to Ohio State, pop Ohio State like you pop Michigan. Victory for MSU is a beautiful game. We'll have time to talk more about it, too, in future podcasts and, and talk about the majesty that was that game. But coming up next, we are going to get a chance to catch up with Josh Katzenstein from the Detroit News, the Detroit News, uh, Detroit Lions beat writer. We're going to have to talk a little bit about what's been going on with the talk of Stafford. The Lions got off the schneid and got their first victory versus the Bears. So we'll, we'll check in with friend of the podcast, Josh Katzenstein, next. Stay with us. Doc and Jock, Detroit Sports Podcast, episode number 115. Doc and Jock here for Fanatic U. If you're looking for some sweet sports swag and you love your Detroit teams, and I mean you really love your Detroit teams, you got to check out FanaticU.com. Check out FanaticU.com. Use promo code DSP, save 15%, even off the clearance items, and get the coolest gear out there and rock your Red Wing shirt, rock your Lion shirt, rock your Old English D to the Tiger games, rock your Piston apparel, wear it till the wheels fall off. Michigan, Michigan State, you know what? They got it too. Check out Fanatic U. They have six locations all over Metro Detroit. Check them out, fanaticu.com. Yeah, we coming now. Come on. Oh, uh, yeah. That's right. We put it down. It's like a family in here, just a little disabled. Putting it down, we lay them out on the table. Yeah. Who's in the house? The brothers in the house. Gotta turn it on. On the phone with us right now is Josh Katzenstein of the Detroit News. Josh, what's going on, buddy? I'm much. How you guys doing? Excellent. So last week I wanted to get you on, and I know you got tied up with with practice and everything that was going on, Um, but I wanted to get you on. I want to talk about the article that you wrote about Matt Stafford and how it's time for the organization to basically part ways with the guy. Um, This is something I think John and I have been kind of screaming about for a while now, and it comes out today that a guy down in Dallas – ends up writing an article basically stating that Matt Stafford is the cure-all for Tony Romo when Tony Romo needs to be replaced. So 
my question for you, I guess we'll just get right to the chase here, is is there some hope there that Dallas is going to come in and, and pick up Matt Stafford and, and, and take him off our hands? And are we missing the boat on Matt Stafford? Is, is, this, is this Goslin guy who's writing for the Dallas Morning News seeing something that all of us who watch every single game is not seeing? No, I don't think uh, he's seeing anything different than we are. I just uh, – Rick Goslin's a, a long-time uh, veteran reporter down in Dallas. I think he – He's either uh, he either grew up here or worked here at some point in his life too, so he has some Detroit ties, which is why he was in the area last week. But um, as with many people in media, he writes a lot of things that I don't agree with, and I didn't agree with a lot of things he said in that Stafford piece. And and one key thing that he and a lot of people that support Stafford constantly point out is that he's one of you know a handful of guys that's ever thrown for 5,000 yards. He's gotten to all these you know, yardage milestones, younger than other people. But ultimately, like, the most important thing a quarterback can do, and and really any player can do, is put their team in position to win football games. And I don't think Matthew Stafford does that enough and has done that enough really since 2011. I think you see a lot of these high yardage numbers, even some of the touchdown numbers that he has, are really inflated because – he puts the team in bad situations where they have to come back a lot or they have to throw a lot because they're losing by, you know, a couple of touchdowns. And that's why his stats are so good because really when you watch the guy, I mean, he just, he makes a lot of poor decisions and he makes mistakes at inopportune times. And that happened again against the bears on Sunday, but uh, you know, the bears let the Lions stay in it and Stafford got another couple of chances and he took advantage of those. And, and I mean, that's sort of, the peak of Matthew Stafford that we've seen that, you know, he'll make some mistakes, but he can make up for them. But at some point you have to wonder, I mean, is he ever going to be able to limit those mistakes? And it's year seven now. And if you go into year eight with that guy, I mean, at what point are you just, you know, hoping more than, you know, anything else? Do you think that he just can't read defenses and and break them down? Is that where a lot of these turnovers are coming from and where a lot of these bad plays are coming from? I don't think that he can't. I just don't think that he's as good at it as some other quarterbacks around the league. And Obviously, things like that are where, you know, veteran guys like Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, Aaron Rodgers, you know, can thrive. I I just really think that, you know, he struggles making multiple reads on a play. I mean, there are a lot of times where he'll make one read, defenses will – zone in on, you know, the guy that he's looking at and then it'll be an interception. And I mean, those things happen pretty regularly. So I think he's got a lot of issues. I think his footwork is a big problem. A lot of people always point to his throwing mechanics as an issue, but I actually think his ability to throw up multiple different arm slots is one of his greatest strengths. It's just that a lot of times the footwork is the reason that he has to make these miraculous looking throws. So I do think that I obviously wrote last week that I think it'd be best for the Lions to move on. And I do think, you know, it sort of works for both sides that Matthew Stafford could have a career resurgence if he were to land elsewhere. That's why I made the, you know, Carson Palmer comparison throughout that piece. Um, So, you know, maybe if he did go to Dallas, you know, he could find a way to uh, find that guy he was back in 2011. I wouldn't necessarily see it happening, but obviously if he was playing with Dez Bryant, it would be very similar to his experience with, Uh, Calvin Johnson but at the end of the day I just don't think that when you look around the league the way some of these teams are built either defense first or quarterback first the Lions right now are quarterback first and I don't think he's a guy you know that can handle that load. Um, Last week versus Arizona he obviously struggled which resulted in him getting pulled in the third quarter. Now this week Golden Tate, others have spoken that there was a renewed fire, a renewed sense of, hey, wanting to show that, hey, that last performance versus Arizona was an aberration. Do you think that he can maybe rebound from a benching and really go on to have more games like what he showed us versus Chicago? I know it's tough based on schemes that uh, opposing defenses give the Lions, but do you see more performances like what we saw versus the Bears, or is it going to be another up-and-down season? I think he can rebound and and play consistently because because he has before I just think that now we're on you know pretty much what is it the fourth year in a row that he hasn't played consistently so 
I'm going to pick the Minnesota Vikings to win on Sunday because I think their defense is really good. I think they're second in the NFL in points allowed this season. And the Lions really just lucked out with the matchup playing against the Bears on Sunday. Certainly, you have to give them credit for creating all those big plays. And any time a team goes over 500 yards, it's because they did a lot of things right. But the Bears secondary is really unimpressive. Their pass rush is mostly non-existent. And I think the Vikings are going to be a really difficult challenge for the Lions. But there is a chance that, you know, they will find a little renewed confidence after the way they beat the Bears. Maybe the coaches will decide that or, or recognize finally that they need to throw it deep more because that's why they had a lot of their success. Because when you're throwing deep and testing teams deep, that's what opens up holes in the running, in the running game. That's what opens up those underneath routes where, you know, guys can get open and create big plays like Golden Tate often does. So there's definitely a chance it'll happen. I just think that we haven't seen the Lions do anything really consistently this season, so I don't know why we should expect that to change now. Josh, how much of this in, in Matt Stafford's struggles this year, and I guess last year as well, is just the way this offense is, is put together and the way it is trying to be ran? And, I mean, Jim Caldwell has been almost stubborn to a fault with, with running this offense and saying it's not the offense, it's the execution. It's basically it's Matt Stafford's fault that this offense can't get going. I mean, this offense doesn't seem like it even comes close to fitting what he does best. And do you think that might be part of the problems and part of the struggle he's having? That's definitely part of the problem. And that was a question or maybe more of a yelling uh, response that I got from a lot of fans after I wrote my Stafford piece. And, And I definitely don't think the coaches should be off the hook. But ultimately, I mean, they are running a scheme that tries to account for Stafford's shortcomings, and he has plenty of them. And they're also trying to balance the shortcomings of the offensive line and, you know, a couple tight ends that don't block very well and, you know, a couple running backs that haven't really proven they can be stars yet. So, I mean, these coaches have to account for a lot of different things, but ultimately on every pass play or most pass plays besides screens, there's a short, intermediate, and deep option And so Stafford has to be the one to pull the trigger on the deep option when he sees it there. And that's where we get back to, you know, his ability to read defenses. If he isn't recognizing the matchups when there are deep options coming open, that falls on him. I think a lot of the uh, free rushers coming in early in the season, that falls on him because he's the one calling those protections. And he has to make sure that, you know, his blockers are taking care of those guys. And then the other thing is, like, I just keep coming back to the idea that, I mean, he's got the ball in his hands. If he really wants to throw it deep, nobody's stopping him. He might get yelled at, but, I mean, it's only going to be if he makes a bad play. And a lot of times these short passes when you're in third and long are are just as bad, if not worse, than a turnover. So, I don't know. It's it's really hard to, you know, decide where the blame goes. But when you look at his numbers and see that he's been basically as inefficient under this coaching staff as he was for the last two years under the last coaching staff, that's why I think it's fair to blame him. Now, part of the reason for the success was the increased presence of the running game. And when you kind of look at really what Abdullah brings to the table, I'm not sure I just see yet a guy that can carry the ball 28 to 30 times like a DeMarco Murray. Do you think a guy like Theo Riddick can be an imposing running back, a guy that you can maybe give the ball to a little bit more? Because right now it seems like Joyke Bell's a little bit ineffective. Abdullah's more like the Reggie Bush, the guy that you can give screens to. Is Theo Riddick a guy that we can maybe look to as a running back that can continue to consistently help this offense? Because Matt Stafford needs an effective running game to have it really any chance. Well, if I was a coach, I would give Theo a lot more carries this week because you have to reward your players when they're doing well. Because, I mean, that's, that goes back to this whole thing that the coaches talk about, that this is a meritocracy, and when you perform well, you're going to play more. So... If I was the coach, I would definitely feed Theo Reddick the ball a lot more. But, I mean, he's pretty unproven as a running back. I think he only played running back for two years, maybe only one at Notre Dame. I mean, that's why he's so good if he's uh, in the receiving game because he has a lot of experience as a slot receiver, Uh, you know, did that a lot at college and and, and has obviously done well with it in the pros. I think really the best running back on the roster is still Amir Abdullah. He might not be ready right now to handle 25 carries a game, but I think if the Lions offense is going to be um, as as threatening as it wants to be, I think at some point you have to find a way to get him all those touches because I don't buy into the idea that he's too small to do it. I mean, he's a 
I mean, he's only 5'9", but he's like a sturdy 205, 210 pounds. He can take a beating. He took a beating at Nebraska. So I think, really, as long as he can fix the ball security issues and just start to show a little bit more than the flashes that he has already, I think he should be the feature back. And then really just, you know, Joyce Bell really only getting in there on, you know, short yardage situations until he shows, if he does, that he can, you know, be be the guy that he was the past few years. Joining us right now is Josh Katzenstein of the Detroit News. It seems like whenever they put Theo Riddick in, everybody knows it's going to be a pass play. He's going to sit there and kind of roll out and either into the flats or he's going to roll out into the back and it's going to be a bubble screen. Don't you think that this coaching staff, in in more from an offensive standpoint, they need to maybe start to disguise these plays and maybe start to run him more, especially if Joy Bell is going to be injured with his ankle and, and Amir Abdullah is going to end up having ball security issues? Yeah, definitely. And I, I think that's one of the predictability things that you know people were talking about a few weeks ago, that really anytime Theo Riddick's on the field, it's going to be a pass. For the most part, when Golden Tate's off the field, it's going to be a run, but I actually asked Mike Zimmer this today during our uh, teleconference with him, and I said, you know, how how does it make the Lions' offense more predictable? You know, because they pass when Riddick is in there so frequently. And basically, what he said is that you still have to defend it. And you know, we've seen over the past year and a half that it's really tough to defend Theo Riddick as a receiver. So even though it is predictable and and defenses might know what's coming. They still don't know which route he's going to run, and they still have to use a linebacker or a safety to cover him, and they still have to have their other players cover Golden Tate and Calvin Johnson and Eric Ebron when he's available. So I think the predictability thing was really overblown. Um, certainly the coaches need to do more and, and have more wrinkles in there, but it, it, it really comes down to execution because even though people made a big deal that defenses knew what the Lions offense was running, the Lions offense should know what the defense is running on most plays, too. Last question. We'll get you out of here on this because I know you're a busy, busy guy, and you got, what you say, five hours of writing ahead of you. So has this offense and has the offense of coordinators and, and Jim Caldwell lost confidence in Amir oh. Abdullah and his ability to hold on to the football? I don't know that they've lost confidence. I think that the confidence might be waning. I mean, he, he he's fumbled three times in the past two games, and that's obviously never a good thing. And, it was unclear if they benched him on Sunday. I mean, he didn't really play at all in the second half. Um, I think he had a couple snaps in the fourth quarter late in the game. But, uh, yeah, I mean, they're definitely looking at their other options to see, you know, what they can do at that position if Abdullah keeps fumbling. I think he's going to get another opportunity on Sunday against the Vikings to be that feature back. But, you know, as we said, Theo Riddick should have some chances. And if Joyce Bell's back, they'll probably get some chances too. So I think uh, it hasn't reached a a boiling point yet, so to speak. But, you know, if he fumbles for a fourth time in three games, then at at some point you have to wonder, you know, how much you can play this guy until, you know, you know you can trust him. All right, Josh, well, we appreciate your time. Go write some great articles. So hopefully when we get you back on here next, we can talk some more Lions. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks for having me on, guys. All right, brother, take it easy. Very interesting stuff. You know, the Lions come away with the victory versus the Bears, and a lot more talk is, is being looked at regarding Matthew Stafford, his role on the team. Is he a guy that's only going to uh, succeed versus the, the bottom feeders? Let's take a quick break, and we'll come back. We'll revisit the game versus the Bears. We'll talk more about Stafford, the running game, and our observations regarding what has happened now as a result of the 1-5 and five start of our Detroit Lions. Doc and Jock, Detroit Sports Podcast, Episode 115. I want to tell everyone out there about DetroitSportsNation.com. They're a great website, and they've been very supportive to all the shows on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. They host all the podcasts. They have great writers that cover all the Detroit teams, all the college teams. Check out their website and support those who support us. DetroitSportsNation.com. The collaboration has been excellent, and it's helped us to continue to grow and have great guests take phone calls. So our collaboration with the Detroit Sports Nation has really been successful, and support those who support us. DetroitSportsNation.com Welcome back. Thank you for downloading another episode of our podcast. We appreciate all the support across our various platforms. Thank you for downloading via iTunes, Stitcher, Podomatic, 
the DetroitSportsNation.com website. We greatly appreciate the support, and that's how we keep these mics hot. That's how we keep rolling out great new shows, and a lot of great things are upcoming in the fall um, during football season and things like that. So a lot of good things are happening. People are requesting to talk to Doc and Jock. We're having a good old time breaking down Detroit sports, and we absolutely love it. And without your support, without the support of the listeners, we couldn't continue to do this project, and it makes it really worthwhile to be able to break down our, our passions in Detroit sports. So, cuz, we got off the schneid. We got our first victory versus the Bears. And first and foremost, I just want to ask you, was it more the fact that, you know, because towards the end of the game, you had national media, you had everyone writing like, this is garbage football. Really? Seriously? Is this really what we've, we've been subjected to with the Bears and the Lions? And I was more gravitating toward Michael Wilbon because he was ripping the Bears left and right. And both teams seemed like they didn't want to win the game. It dragged down into overtime where finally Matthew Stafford made the key play to Calvin, threw a, threw a great deep ball. Calvin had the mismatch. He made the play. We won the game. But you just can't help. Obviously, I'm excited we won the game. But you can't help but realize that, you know what, when you watch the Lions, it really kind of is more dictated by what the opponent does to us. You know, Chicago's terrible on defense. People are saying, well, their defense wasn't that bad, but their secondary was suspect. Dude, their they, defense is horrible. I mean, they, I mean, I've never seen a team that didn't know that you never, ever, ever go man-to-man with Calvin Johnson. Ever. Not, not a once. But they did it. They tried it, and it, it didn't work. They made Matthew Stafford look amazing. He, he, they had numbers similar to what they had back in 2013 between him and Calvin. Right. And the thing is, is it more of an aberration, or is it something that, you know— we we should expect to see more. Was it the Lions or was it really the Bears? No, I you know what, and I think you nailed it when, when you when you, you kind of said it without saying it. This really seemed like it was a game where who wanted it least is what it kind of at the end there seemed like. And you said it right when you said that the Lions' offense goes by what the defense dictates to them, which is horrible, horrible. If you look at some of the best offenses around the league, you look at what Aaron Rodgers does in Green Bay. You look at what Tom Brady does in New England. If you look at what Peyton Manning used to do with Denver and, and with Indianapolis, all right. You look at you look at those three. You even you know even go back and take Drew Brees, all right. Look at what Drew Brees does with with the Saints. Those defenses adjust to what that offense is going to do. That defense has to spend time studying to sit there and figure out how they can sit there and, and, and stop that offense. As juxtapose that with ours, where it's just like, okay, well, this is what they're doing, so now we have to do this. Our, our offense is a reactionary offense, which is horrible. You don't ever want that. If your defense is reactionary, that's fine, because you're trying to adjust, and you're trying to cover those receivers, and you're, you're, you're doing what you do best. You know, you sit there, you take away the line of scrimmage, that's fine. Now they're going to try to throw on you. All right, And if they're going to try to throw on you, you drop another man back, and, and you sit there, and you try to take that away. All right, That's what defenses are supposed to do. But ours is our offense is totally different. And you hit the head, you hit the nail right on the head when you said that. I mean, when I was watching the game, I left feeling with a with a mixed emotion on on I was happy they got the win, but I didn't really think they deserved it. I really didn't. I mean, I mean, Chicago's not a good team, and then you end up getting in a shootout with them? Come on, for real? And I almost thought they didn't even want to win the game. I mean, when it was going into overtime, I thought for sure Chicago was gonna sit there and get that next touchdown. And again, the referees made the game really tough to watch with all the reviews, with really plays that you don't know. Like, really, they've really kind of made it difficult to understand what a touchdown is. I thought Dude. a touchdown was when the ball clears the line. That's it. But then, and then it brings back uh, shit that how happened many, in the past. Yeah. How many times are the Lions going to be involved with these things? Because I didn't think that was a touchdown when Golden Tate scored. Did you? I didn't think so either. I thought it was a fumble. I thought it was too. But I guess, I guess once the ball crosses the plane and you make a move. Then it's a touchdown, and luckily, hey, well, we'll we'll take it. But then at the end of the game, you know, you had situations where it was, you know, something that you could also question. You know, that uh, roughing the passer penalty that allowed the Lions to kind of they take got the a little lead. bit lucky there. They got a little bit lucky there, and it just it just seemed like you know what I did. I tried something different to to not get so angry. I did not watch a single frame of that game on the television, all radio. And Dan Miller almost had a coronary <laughs> the, the rest <laughs> the end of the game. But I was still getting pissed because what happens is. And you try to not tell yourself that bad things are going to happen, but the Lions were having success and they were playing well. And you just tell yourself, okay, just don't turn the ball over. Don't do something stupid. Just make basic football plays. And again, that pass that Matthew Staff- whatever you want to call that, that Matthew Stafford attempted versus the Bears, he can't do that at this point in his career. Those are big momentum swingers. And the Lions can't afford to make plays like that. That's the reason why Matthew Stafford is under the microscope so much. And you got people writing that he should be gone, that he's not the guy. 
But in the end, people love stats. They're enamored by, oh my gosh, he threw for four touchdowns and big yardage. Granted, when is he going to do that versus Green Bay? When is he going to do that versus a solid defense like Denver? He's had the two tests. Yes, what's good is he's able to go out and defeat bums like the Bears who come who came to the game with only two wins. Fine, but can you go do that against a team like Denver? Can you go out and do that against a team like Green Bay? That's all we're asking. We know and the value and the reason why a lot of the fans want to keep Matthew Stafford is the Lions' history of quarterbacks has been abysmal. He's been the best of the worst. But you can't live your life letting history dictate your future. But now, you can't. now the fear when we look at Stafford is if he leaves, if he's gone, if they decide to go in a different direction, can we maybe have seasons like 10, 11 wins every other year? So right now I'm starting to weigh the option of should we keep Stafford. I'm, I was firmly planted in saying no. But then when you talk about it and you kind of look at it and you ask the question, who's next? Then you get a little bit worried because, you know, right now, do we settle on just getting to the playoffs, having one good season every three years? Because if you get a rookie quarterback, you might not have, you have a good season for a long time. But in the end, right now as we sit, my thoughts on Stafford are you can let him go. You, you haven't in the big picture, the grand scheme of things, gotten a playoff win. That's why good organizations every year draft a quarterback somewhere in their draft, or they go and they pick one up out of free agency after the draft. I wanted them to take Brett Hundley this year. I have no idea if he's the second coming of Christ. Green Bay apparently thinks he's worth taking a flyer on. They took him in the fifth round. I wanted Detroit to take him in the fourth round. Just a guy, maybe try to push Stafford. Maybe you get something there. You look at what New England did with Tom Brady. Drafted him in the sixth round. They said, you know what? We got a sixth round. Basically, it's a throwaway pick, right? Sixth and seventh round, throwaway picks. Just try to get something. And look what you got. You got a Hall of Fame quarterback Out of your sixth round, you know, you got Detroit Lions sitting there blowing first overall picks on QBs, and you're still sitting there scratching your head like, did we get it right? Not really sure. We're seven years into this project and a whole bunch of question marks. It's a giant disaster, and they're just not a good organization, and they don't do the things that good organizations do to set themselves up. Because in two years, what do you have for a quarterback? You got Dan Orlovsky. That's, that's it's basically your backup right now. I know he's on a one-year deal, but Dan Orlovsky is your backup right now. So unless something good walks through that door in the next two years, you're going to extend Matt Stafford. You're going to pay him millions upon millions more dollars to sit here and stay and to keep throwing the same ball that he's still throwing. So help me understand, for those that are supportive of Matthew Stafford, is it the numbers? Is it the fact that they've seen guys who are ineffective, who couldn't throw the ball deep, who couldn't light the lamp every once in a while. What are the supporters seeing? It's both. It's both. What are they seeing? You're you're, you're terrified because you live through through the Scott Mitchell era when he was brutal. You you live through the Charlie Batch era. You you live through the era when when you had Dan Orlovsky running out of the back of the end zone. You live through the John Kitten era. You live through that time period, and that scares you because you don't want to go back to it. And then you see a guy like Matt Stafford who looks like he possesses all of the tools in the playbook, right? He's got the arm strength. He's he's semi-charismatic when when he's in front of the camera and he's not being grilled about a loss. You know, he he has the ability to sit there and and heave the ball 90 yards downfield and and link up with Calvin Johnson. So he looks like he has the talent. You You look at his stats, and everybody always goes to his stats, and I really think his stats are hollow. You point to his stats and you say, hey, look, He's one of the youngest quarterbacks to ever reach this plateau, this plateau, this plateau, and he's gotten us to playoff games. He's gotten us to two. That's more than almost every other guy combined has done. So you factor all that in, and everybody's like, we got to keep him. We have to. I mean, there's talent there. He's a good quarterback. It's got to be the coaches. We got to change the coach. No, you're seven years into this project, and by the time it's all said and done, you'll be almost nine years into this project. And if he doesn't cut down on the INTs, and he doesn't sit there and, 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 the, and the touchdown to INT ratio doesn't go up and the decision-making doesn't get better, then why are you keeping him? Because he's not putting you in spots to win games. And I think that's something that Josh was getting at. He's not putting you in spots to win games. You know, he's not helping you out. And, and I think that's part of the problem right now. And so I think, and I think also part of the reason everyone's supporting Stafford is there's a great fear that should he be let go, should he sign somewhere else, that he goes to a Dallas who builds a line around him, who gives him a running back, and he has success and gets some playoff wins. I don't see, as we talk today, sitting here in the middle of October, halfway, almost halfway through the season, 
seeing that Matthew Stafford could go to another organization and win a Super Bowl. I don't see that. I see a guy that maybe if you build a line around him and give him some some weapons and things like that, that can get you some playoff wins. But to actually raise his game to the next level, I feel like we know what we got. We basically got a guy who's in between a backup and a starter, a guy that's a you know a middle of the road between 10 and 20 quarterback, and a guy that's not. The problem is, though, we all want Tom Brady. We all thought as a number one pick he could be maybe like an Aaron Rodgers. And in the end, it's time to realize that's not what you got. You know, you can live with the interceptions and you can live with the turnovers as long as you're winning games. That was something Brett Favre made a career out of. He would sit there, he'd turn the ball over at an astonishing clip. I think his touchdown to inter- interception ratio is one. He threw just as many touchdowns as he did INTs. But you know what? That guy won. He won consistently. He won in spite of his turnovers. Matt Stafford can't seem to get out of his own way. Okay, so now the Lions have won their first game. And there's maybe talk that, hey, if you can maybe get over the hump, beat Minnesota, Kansas City's a little bit injury, you know, hobbled by injuries. Over there in London, you had success in London last year. Maybe is there a chance, what percentage chance you give them to come back three and five? None, dude. None. Zero? None. Yeah, it's tough. Absolutely none. You know, I mean. I don't know how you could say it, but you just game to game. That's all we can really do. None. You can't foreshadow the future with with this team. I mean, there, there, game could, game. there could be a crazy injury that happens, and next thing you know, you're without Calvin Johnson, right? I mean, it's just, no, I'm not going to foreshadow anything. And Just go I, game to game? I, yeah, I don't even, you know what, I don't, we'll talk about it in the picks, but I don't even know if they've got enough to win this week. So, I mean, so, I don't know. So some, some it, of the storylines in this game versus Chicago involved the fact that there was a semblance, a heartbeat of a running game. You know, the lines were a little bit more aggressive. They faked the punt. They got more chunk plays. They were able to show some things on offense, you know. So those were the positives, and it, hopefully they can carry that momentum. The part that was concerning to me, though, is that, yes, it's easy to muscle up against the Bears. Why is it that it took a benching for Cal- – uh, why is it that it took a benching for Matthew Stafford to kind of really show that emotion and that passion and to be the leader in that locker room? That should be his That should be his MO week after week. The Lions should not be sitting here – one and five. Do you really think that there was a difference between last week and this week with Matt Stafford? Because watching the film, it looks like a lot of the same. It just, I think they went up against a worse team. I, again, like you said, I think they take advantage of the bad teams. This week, however, I mean, they threw the ball deeper much more. And I think that opened up the playbook. I sat there, I did some calculations here. Passes over 20 yards. They threw eight last game as opposed to 15 the previous games, the previous five games. I mean, you know, it it just, that's what Matt Stafford does. That is, that's how Matt Stafford operates. That's how he gets his yards. That's how he looks good. He goes deep to Calvin or he goes deep to Golden Tate. And that's what makes him look like he's this quarterback that everybody in this area wants to keep. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like the Lions are figuring stuff out, but it's like too late. You exactly. know, Theo Riddick is now a guy that uh, again, you feature. They're reactionary. And this is something that me and you had talked about. We didn't talk about it on the podcast, but this is something I had said to you off mic. Why aren't you featuring Theo Riddick more? I mean, he's good enough to get into your two-minute drill, but you can't play him more often? It, it, that makes absolutely no sense. If the guy is good enough for clutch time, then why isn't he out there in the beginning, the middle, and near the end of the games? Why are you only inserting him... In the last two minutes of each half, it makes absolutely no sense the way this offense runs. It blows my mind. Blows my mind. Yeah, it's tough, it's tough to look at because, you know, I know it's good that we, we won the game. We were able to actually, you know, step up and actually win the game versus Chicago. That would have been devastating, and we could have been talking about a whole bunch of new things had the Lions lost the game. We could have been talking about maybe the removal of Jim Caldwell, maybe some people being let go after an 0-6 start. But it kind of silences the noise a little That's bit. That's wishful thinking. It silences the critics for one more week. I do believe, though, I, they need to go all in again versus Minnesota. Keep the same game plan. And I know they're going to downplay the fact that uh, Joe Lombardi was up in the booth, but if that's what it takes, hey. I think that was a huge reason for this for this W this week. I don't know if it was a huge reason. Oh, I do. You think so? I do because if you look at the, if you look at the play calling, the play calling was different this week than it was the previous couple weeks. It was. So I think he sees the field better, and I think having Jim Bob Cooter on the sideline, I think there's a better communication and there's a better rapport there when Matt Stafford can take that direction from Cooter than he can from from Lombardi. You know what's interesting? I think Jim Caldwell a little bit is getting a little bit grumpy and annoyed with all the with the with the media here in Detroit. It was a victory. He looked. He sounded grumpy. Sounded annoyed by the line of questioning regarding what was going on. With the that that people were asking like, "Wow, your offense looked better." And he's like, "Yeah, this is our this is our real offense. We just executed it." 
Well, no. The reason why people are surprised was you scored points, you you moved the ball more efficiently, you actually showed a, a running game, and it didn't look as predictable as it did in the past. So you had, I think Caldwell's not willing to concede, and he's really setting up a us-versus-them mentality, and now Stafford's the same way. I don't like that. I don't like the fact that Stafford has set up a, a us-versus-them mentality. We're all one fan base. We all know what's going on. I mean, we all can see that... Uh, opposing defenses have kind of a grasp as to what you're doing on offense. I don't understand why Matthew Stafford might be a little bit, you know, coming out and saying, well, I don't pay attention to the fans or the media. Well, you should be because, you know. Well, you know what? If he doesn't, his wife sure does. Because <laughs> she's always posting stuff on Instagram. Hey, Somebody that, needs to take her phone away. That's not going to stop it. And she should. I really think, you know, I, I, I go back and forth on that. But, you know, the heat was bad. It was very bad when he got benched. Win games. Win games. You notice what happened when he won games? <laughs> it was all good. It, it was a lot quieter around here. Man, I don't know, man. I try trying to be more positive with the Lions, but it just and really what stinks is that you're battling your perception of the Lions. You really can't expect them to week in and week out have consistent play. This week I'm looking forward to seeing what they can do versus Minnesota. You obviously know that you have to stop AP, you have to stop Teddy Bridgewater and not allow him to dictate the pace of the game and not make big plays. I really think they have a chance to win the game. And, you know, ride the momentum and play a little bit better. But you know what sucks with the Lions now? You realize we're going to be gripping for 60 minutes each and every week. It is allowed to go out and dominate a team. It doesn't have to be a five-point game week in and week out. The Lions are allowed to score like 28 points and only allow three. It is allowed, but it's tough. So last week, I went with the whole radio approach, not watch him on TV. I might try it again, but I was still getting pissed. I was trying to limit. I was like, when Stafford had that turnover, I was like, what, what is going on? Why is it going on like this? But I'm still into it. I'm still watching. I'm, I'm not giving up on the Lions. It's just tough to, um, it's tough to see the light at the end of the tunnel based on the scheme, based on the talent, based on the fact that we've got injuries all over the place. It's tough to see, and it's tough to have hope. I don't know how those that are all about Stafford, all about the Lions still at 1-5 and five, can sit there and still, and still do it. You know, you just got to take it one game at a time. Yeah, I agree with you. It's, I don't expect them to blow any teams out going forward the rest of this season. I just don't see it. Against Minnesota, this is going to be a tough week. I mean, Adrian Peterson feasts on the Lions. He shows up and he just devours them. I think they got something decent with Teddy Bridgewater. I think he's figured out that offense. I think they know what they're doing out there. It's going to be a tough week. Like you said, we're going to be gripping and clutching for 60 minutes here. All right, let's get to these picks. Last week wasn't a great week for Dr. Jack. Uh, you, but you still walked away with the lead. I like how I pick uh, the Giants and they get rolled by <laughs> Philadelphia. Man, Philadelphia is the hardest team to <laughs> judge. I, I picked Atlanta and they got steamrolled by the Saints. So come on, whatever. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, what are you going to do? Good but, luck. <laughs> but as we speak now, you're leading 13 to 12 in what we call the NFL Pick'em Challenge. All right, my first pick. I'm going with the Atlanta Falcons minus three and a half at Tennessee. I'm not expecting Marcus Mariota to play. Zat Mettenberger doesn't scare me, and their center's now on IR. I expect the Falcons' defense to have a field day and Atlanta's run game to keep producing and scoring. Now factor in the extra rest. Give me the Dirty Birds the flock, minus three and a half. Man, I have to go with the teams that get dominated, and I know Tampa Bay's struggling a little bit. They're playing a little bit better, but I do believe that Washington uh, with Kirk Cousins, I know his season's up and down, but I do think that once... He is facing adversity. He usually rises up. Right now, you're seeing in Washington what it's like to not have a a marquee quarterback. Kirk Cousins is the definition of a prototype of a backup. He's a guy that's starting right now. He has the support of Jay Gruden, who makes excuses for all the mistakes that Cousins is making. But he's sticking by him and riding the wave, and I do think they'll have enough to uh, take down Tampa Bay. And so with my first pick, I'm taking Washington minus 3.5 at home versus Tampa Bay. All right, with my next pick, I'm taking the Oakland Raiders plus four at San Diego. The Raiders are coming off of a bye week, and this ball hawking defense has forced five interceptions and has recovered four fumbles. And they're going to take on a Chargers offense that likes to throw the ball around the yard and has a habit putting it on the ground. So give me the Raiders and the points. Now, I know there's some lines that are kind of a little bit higher this week, but I like the way the Jets have been playing. I do think that they are not going to cow down to the New England Patriots, but man, it's, it's tough. To, when you see numbers like nine, to not take the points. But I I, I can't do it. I, I have to take the Jets plus nine. But, you know, it's one of those bets. It's one of those picks you make where you go, you could easily see New England rolling up 50 points each and every week. But, you know, the Jets are playing a lot better. I know they're going on the road, but I do think they're going to want to show that they can compete. So with my second pick, I'm taking the Jets plus nine. 
last week I went against the New Orleans Saints. I'm not doing it twice. All right, I'm taking the New Orleans Saints plus four and a half at the Indianapolis Colts. All right, I panned them last week and that bit me in the ass. This week, Breeze appears to have found his Jimmy Graham, his pseudo backup in Benjamin Watson. They have a little bit of extra rest. So give me the points and give me who dat. Now we got a situation, a rivalry game. So in in this situation, I know Seattle's not playing the best and I know San Francisco isn't really firing on all cylinders either, but it's a game that's within the division and both teams usually play well. So I think the game is going to be close. So with my third pick in San Francisco, I'm taking the 49ers plus six. Ooh, San Fran plus six. I still think Seattle will win the game close within maybe five, three to five points. But I do think uh, San Francisco plus the points for my third pick. And now you got to pick the Lions, brother. What do you see? Oh, boy, the Lions. All right. The Lions need overtime to beat a bad Bears team. So that's not good, all right? They also need Matt Stafford to throw for over 400 yards and four TDs. It's not much better. So I don't think it's going to help at all this week. You got AP, who I said before, feasts on this team. He gets prepared and jacked up because he likes to put 200 yards up at a clip. All right, I'm going to lay the points, and I'm going to take Captain Matterhorn. So give me the Vikes minus two and a half. Ooh, now, if if you notice a trend, I've gone along with what you've said. But in order to kind of push ahead, you got to roll the dice a little bit. Oh, Leo's, huh? Listen, I hope they win. I never believe they win. I know it's stupid to bet the Lions, but here's my thinking on what's going to happen. The Lions are going to be playing at home. The Lions are going to try and put forth their best effort on offense and really play well because they do know that they can. They have a semblance of hope is still there within the locker room. They know they've just seen Matthew Stafford throw the ball deep. I do think that Minnesota didn't look that great last week versus Kansas City, and I do think that with with the renewed confidence in Matthew Stafford, Golden Tate, everybody on the same page at home, that'll be the edge for the Lions. So I'm going to take. In the Pick'em Challenge, the Lions. The spread's two and a half, so I'm going to take the points. Lions plus two and a half to outright win the game along the lines of 24-17. Ooh, boy. I'm hoping. Dude, you got big brass ones to do that. I'm not doing it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to be tough. I know, but, you know, e- each game they've played has been close for the most part, so I, you got to do it. You got you to separate yourself. If I made the picks, you know, in the early rounds good, then that'll help me kind of take an, extend the lead, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. It might, be my, it might be my first and only time picking with the Lions all year. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? Man, great podcast, cuz. What are you going to do, man? I, I, I actually love the fact, being a Sparty, that in that fashion, the shock that that victory reverberated. I was at a house that was pro-Michigan. So I was watching the game. I was the only guy there that was cheering for State. And we were talking about, you know, Harbaugh should just get a blank check and make his own deals and stuff like that. When the play happened... I was shocked. I didn't. It didn't register to me that Michigan State could actually go and get into the end zone to win the game. So I was screaming, get down, get down, so we can kick the field goal. So I, I didn't think that he was going to be able to actually make it into the end zone. So there's about like two seconds left by the time he got there. So I was like in shock. And then by the time you realize that they won the game, I was screaming my little head off. And I was like, you know, f- just thinking all the people that text me, are you scared? Are you scared? I mean, no, I wasn't scared. I wasn't like confident. But I wasn't scared. I knew it was going to be a competitive game. And it was just every fan base deserves to experience a miracle like that. And, and my Sparties have done it now a couple times that Keith Nickel play reverberates with me. And this play now will live in infamy. Whenever, whenever there's disrespect to Michigan State and D'Antonio in the program, all you got to do is look back to the miracle in Ann Arbor that happened in uh, October of 2015. I'll never forget it. It'll be, it'll be seared in my memory forever. 10-17, 2015, the night that the punter just handed the ball and handed the victory to Michigan State after hard-fought three and a half hours. Amazing. So what are you going to say? So you can say, it's great, and uh, ho- hopefully we have many more memories like this in this rivalry. What a rivalry. What a great rivalry. What a I great thing you. part of Yes, sir. I hate you. Just, For, just, just, just let's close this. Go green, go white. For the jock, Adam Strozinski, I am the doc, John McAroon. You've been listening to 115th podcast from Doc and Jock on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Go Wings. And I, all I can say is Detroit Sports Podcast scores. I have voices in my head. They count to me. They understand. They talk to me.